I'll invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them, this morning and turn to Romans chapter 5. A couple of weeks ago in our time in Genesis 17, we walked through the idea of names in the Bible and specifically how it is that God used the idea of a name change to indicate something much deeper and more significant in the text. Uh, We talked about this a little bit with Hagar, and and we'll talk actually a little bit more about Hagar next week. Um, And I had mentioned actually with Hagar and in Genesis 17, uh, this idea of uh, of a new name and a name change. Um, And then we saw it also with Abraham and Sarah a couple of weeks ago, that God changed their names from Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. And in doing so, God was indicating a formal change of association. Now, it has been many chapters since Abram believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, being thus justified by faith. And it will be a few more chapters before Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, and so having his faith justified by his works, as we read about in James 2 some time ago. And if you weren't around or don't remember us talking through the biblical relationship between faith and works, as we've talked about it at Legacy, I encourage you to go back and listen to that sermon I preached it on September 13th of 2023. It was called Abraham Believed God, Faith and Works. But it is sufficient to say that the day Abraham's name was changed was not the day he was justified. That day was formally announced in Genesis 15. That day, uh, in many senses, goes all the way back to Genesis 12 when Abraham left his family. And, of course, Abraham's name was not changed until Genesis 17. However, we see nonetheless that this name change is significant, just as it was significant when God chose Ishmael's name, just as it was significant with Isaac's name. And even as God ordained the name of the sons of Abraham to be given to them on the eighth day at their initiation through the covenant of circumcision, Genesis well establishes that this name change, that this idea of a name as a part of the inducting into the covenant was something that was in fact important. It was not just a historical record of things, but it was a a beginning of a principle by which when a man has a significant interaction with God, whereby he exercises faith in God's word, before we even see his change of action or thinking, there are times where we see a fundamental change in identity and association that is indicated by a name change. Now, names didn't always change, but the name change was intended to show us What is a principle that undergirds the scriptures that a relationship with God, a a fundamental relationship with God, a true relationship with God brought about a fundamental change of identity and of association. And what we find in the Old Testament as this this physical name change is actually a shadow of a principle that is realized in the New Testament in its fullest glory through the finished work of Jesus Christ and through the gospel. That when a man has a significant interaction with God, whereby he exercises faith in God's word, he puts his faith in Jesus Christ and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he receives a fundamentally different identity and association. And that's what I would like us to walk through today on this New Year's Eve. Thinking through the year that is to come, thinking through this new year that starts tomorrow. Every man and woman who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior undergoes a fundamental change of identity at the moment of said faith. But the question today is, are we living in a manner that is consistent with the change of identity that we had at that moment of faith? And in order to think through this, I would like us to think through Paul's teaching in Romans 5 and 6. Now, as with all of Paul's letters, the book of Romans has a very distinct organizational structure to it. In chapters 1 through 5, we see Paul speak of the need and the reality of justification by grace alone through faith alone, that men are condemned through their unbelief, that men's unbelief is confirmed through their wicked works, and that God then has declared all men guilty, all men under sin, that he might have mercy upon all men who would believe upon him through grace. Then in Romans chapter 6 through 8, uh, we see the implications of justification by grace through faith. What does it mean that one is 
under grace. What does it mean that, that, that he has this grace that is given to him, not through his works, but through, well, through grace, through no merit of his own? Does this mean that one who is under grace can sin without, without issue, can sin with impunity? What is the believer's relationship to sin? Once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, what is your relationship to your old nature, to your flesh, to your sin? Does the sin nature go away at the moment of justification? How should we understand our place in this world and in our own bodies under grace? And Romans 6 through 8 speak to that idea. Then in Romans chapters 9 through 11, we see what is more or less a parenthesis. It's very parenthetical in nature. What about the Jews? Paul addresses the question, if God's system is one of grace through faith, if Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law and that law was ordinances that were against us to bring us to guilt and Jesus Christ has thus fulfilled that in himself, if access to the promises of God comes through the finished work of Christ, well then what about all of the promises that God made to the Old Testament Jewish people? A people who still have and still do vehemently reject the person and work of Jesus Christ as Messiah. What about them? If God made all of these promises to them and more or less the church has become an inheritor of the prophetic promises that were given to this people, does that mean that God has cast them off? And of course, Paul's answer in Romans 9 through 11 is God forbid, absolutely not. God has not cast off his people whom he has foreknown. And then in, verses, in chapters 12 through 16, Paul then kind of comes back to the, the, the more clear structure that we saw in 1 through 5 and then 6 through 8. In um, 12 through 16, he gets back to that more direct structure, more direct purpose. He teaches about what it looks like, practically speaking, to live under the economy of grace, how we ought to deport ourselves toward God, and even more so, how we ought to deport ourselves one toward God. Another, and this is very common. If you look at all of Paul's epistles, they, they kind of carry this flavor. You could argue with Hebrews, but then a lot of people argue as to whether or not Hebrews is even written by Paul. Um, but if you look at Romans, if you look at the prison epistles, if you look at uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they all carry this sort of structure where Paul begins with doctrinal teaching. And then about halfway through the epistle, he transitions from the doctrine to the practical reality of the Christian life as it's lived based upon the doctrine he's just taught. And so he teaches the doctrine, then he teaches the practical application to that doctrine. And by the way, that's how I structure my sermons, and I do that because of Paul. I, I first teach the, 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 the doctrinal structure or the narrative structure of what we're going through, and then we transition to what does that mean for us in our Christian life. And the reason why I do that is because Paul does that, and Paul's a very effective teacher in our New Testament, and so I found that I can probably do no better than to emulate him in that, uh, in that effort. Now, today we're actually going to focus in on Romans chapter 6, but to do so, I, I have to begin in Romans 5, because that's where the transition really happens from that 1 through 5 section of justification by grace through faith into what does that mean for us in our Christian life, and that's the question that I'm asking today. The question is, if I have newness of life, then what are the implications for how I'm supposed to be living? And that transition happens, the implication of that happens from Romans 5 to Romans 6. So I am still going to, of course, be jumping into context today. Anytime you're in a Pauline epistle, if you don't start at chapter 1, verse 1, you are very much jumping into context. Uh, it's unavoidable in a Pauline epistle. But I can't go back to the beginning. That would take too long. So we're just going to do the best we can starting in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says this in verses 1 and 2 of Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now notice we are here in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, we begin with a, a therefore. And the old adage goes, when you see a therefore in your Bibles, you should figure out what it's there for, right? You know you're stepping into context if you're beginning with a therefore. And starting out in a context on a Sunday morning with a therefore gives me a little bit of a twitch, but we have to do it this morning. So we're just going to jump in and we're going to, we're going to, you can go back and read chapters one through four later and uh, pick it up. But in this case, it's a little bit easier because the foundation of this therefore is actually quite well represented in the words that follow. Therefore, being justified by faith. What Paul has taught and established in chapters one through four is that man is justified by faith. 
And the therefore is actually this, that if a man is in fact justified by faith, well then he has peace with God. He has peace with God, not through himself, but he has peace with God through his Lord Jesus Christ, through what Jesus Christ has done for him on the cross. This justification by faith in Jesus Christ ushers us into a state of imputed righteousness, meaning I am declared righteous on behalf of what Jesus Christ has done for me. That is justification. And that means that there's nothing between me and my heavenly father, not because I'm not a sinner, but because Jesus paid for my sin. So that being justified by faith, if I am justified by faith, if faith is what justifies me and I have accepted Jesus Christ as my savior so that I have stepped by faith into that relationship so that I am justified, then I have peace with God. Then I am in a place of peace with God, of reconciliation with God. All my sin was laid on Jesus on the cross and the only sin then for which a man is accountable with regard to justification is the sin of unbelief. And at the moment that I exercise that faith in Jesus Christ and I step into belief, I am justified. Therefore, there is absolutely nothing between me and the creator God. At that moment of belief, a man also, Paul says, gains access to grace by which not only am I not resting under the judgment of my sin, but notice Paul says, it is a grace wherein we stand. We do not just get grace, we stand in grace. It is the manner of living. It is our mode of operation to live under grace. And so that causes us to re rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hope in our Bibles is not a fearful longing of something which may or may not happen. Hope is a joyful and earnest expectation. It is, a, is the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good. Hope in the Bible is not when you hope that maybe someday you can get somewhere, but it's when your bags are packed, it's when your ticket is punched, and you're simply waiting for the date to come. That is the idea of biblical hope. So skipping a few verses, Paul then says in verses 6 through 10, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Consider the spiritual relationship presented here. When we were without strength, the idea here is this is the condition of all men through Adam's sin. Through Adam's sin, we are sinners. We confirm that we are sinners by the things that we do every day. We are born with this sin nature, and a guilty man must pay. Even if you or I stopped sinning today, forever, we never once sinned again, which even if I can do that, I, I won't do that. But if I did, the problem is I'm already guilty. I've already fallen short. I am already without strength to do anything about what, I've, what I have already, the, the, the debt I've already incurred. I already have no power and no provision in this world or in the next to fix the problem that I'm in. I have dug myself into a hole and I have no capacity to dig myself out of it. If I am guilty, then I must stand before the judge. And if when I stand before the judge, I am guilty, even if I'm, I, I stop sinning today and I live the rest of my life without sinning, when I stand before a righteous judge, I have already sinned, I am guilty. And if I am guilty, then I deserve the punishment. And the punishment is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, when we talk about death in the Bible, we recognize that physical death is actually a metaphor, right? The fact that man started to physically die, as we talked about early in Genesis, the fact that man started to physically die in the garden after he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was actually a metaphor for something else that happened the moment he ate of that fruit. 
The moment that he ate of that fruit, he spiritually died. He was spiritually separated from God. And if I, if my body ceases to function in a state, so I physically die in a state where I am spiritually dead, where I am separated from the Father, where I, there is sin between me and the Father, then I must be separated from him for eternity. You say, well, pastor, plenty of other religions solve this problem by saying that there's an opportunity in the afterlife. There's another chance. Oh, except the scriptures say it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. Judgment comes after death. One death, and after this, the judgment. Then there's a second death. And the second death is for those that are guilty in that judgment. And so I have no power. I have no provision. The Bible says all of my righteousnesses, Isaiah 64, are as filthy rags before a holy God. No amount of money can earn my way into favor with God. No amount of time, no amount of penance can amount to even the smallest glimmer of God's holiness. I cannot attain unto his holiness. I have already fallen short. I am already guilty. I am already separated. So that I am truly, as Paul says here, without strength. But when I was without strength, the scriptures tell us, in due time, in the right time, when, 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 when the time was fulfilled, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. That's you. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, for a good man peradventure some would dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us. God loved me so much. God loved you so much. We might die for a righteous man. We might die for a good man. Under certain circumstances, we might be willing to give our lives for someone with whom we thought that their life was worth something. We might sacrifice our lives for our children. We might sacrifice our lives in order to uphold some sort of ideal uh, that our country represents. We might do that. But who would die for wicked men? God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I was the furthest thing from righteous that I could possibly be, Christ died for me. Jesus Christ the righteous did what I cannot do. He earned God's favor. He earned God's forgiveness for sin. He paid for it with his blood. He purchased my redemption. I was without strength. Jesus had all power. I had no power. Jesus died for me. So that through his death, I could be justified. Now we've talked about that word justification. I've kind of defi defined it. When we talk about that word justification, it means that I am declared righteous on the basis of, what, of Christ's satisfying payment for my sin. I am declared righteous on the basis of Jesus' payment, that is me being declared righteous, that is me being justified. I owed a debt I could never pay. Jesus paid that debt for me with his blood. But Jesus did more than this. Jesus did more than just die to justify me. Much more, verse 9 said, being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Not just declared righteous, but reconciled to God through the death of his son. I'm not just begrudgingly released from guilt. God did not just say to Jesus, well, fine, if that's what you're gonna do, if you're gonna pay for it, I guess I have to accept it because you're righteous and this is what you chose to do with your righteousness. You chose to bear all this into the world. Okay, fine. I begrudgingly let them, I begrudgingly release them. I begrudgingly let them into heaven. That's not it. The Bible says that I am reconciled. Much more, I am reconciled. And being reconciled, I'll be saved by his life. I was not just begrudgingly released from guilt. I was brought close. I was accepted. Think about that. You were not just released from guilt, begrudgingly. God did not just say, okay, fine. Have those people if you love them so much. God said, this is right. This is good. This was my will. Now all of you who will accept him, 
come back to me with open arms. This is what God wanted. Jesus died on the cross because God so loved the world. Jesus died on the cross because it was the will of the Father that he should do so, so that we might be brought back to the Father. Jesus, and, and the reason why we, we know this is because Jesus didn't just die. Jesus died and he paid for our sin, but Jesus also rose again. And in raising again, he secured not just my forgiveness, but also my reconciliation. He brought not just forgiveness, but he brought life from the dead. Paul goes on then to establish the very theological foundation for this truth. And while this is not the point of our time together, the expression is, is poignant and beautiful, so I want to read it together. Verses 12 through 19, I'm skipping a few verses here and there for time, but Genesis, or Genesis, been there for a while. Uh, Romans 5, verses uh, 12 through 19, the Bible says this. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam was a type for Christ. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by, one, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Notice the focus here. Notice what doesn't come into the picture here. Notice that Paul actually isn't speaking about you and me. You and I fall into this by proxy of the fact that we are children of Adam. You and I fall into that scenario by, 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 by proxy of the fact that, that Adam has sinned and so sin passed upon all men for that all have sinned. That's me, that's you, we all have sinned. But the focus here isn't about you, it's not about me, it's not talking about what you have or have not done. What you have done in your life, the, 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 the way that you have spent your years does not factor into the equation of this transaction. It is about what Adam did in his day, what we are now living in because of that, the, 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 the sin nature that we have, and then what Jesus did to undo it. When we were without strength, it is here that Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself. By Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners, but by the obedience of this man, Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Pastor, does that mean that everybody is now saved, that everybody has been forgiven? Well, in a sense, everyone has been forgiven, but was everyone saved? No. Jesus' death on the cross made provision. He, he, he paid the price for every single sin that has ever been committed. But here's the thing. As that happened, if you think of this as a transaction, imagine that I owed a sum that I could never pay to a man. And you owed the, a sum that you could never pay to that same man. And I looked at you and I said, I'm going to pay off your debt. And you'd look at me and say, you're crazy. You can't even pay off your own debt. You can't even pay off the interest on your debt. How are you going to pay off your debt? You certainly can't pay off my debt if you can't even pay off your debt. And the same would be if you came up to me and said, I'm going to pay off your debt. I'd say, you're crazy. You can't even pay the interest on your debt. There's no way that you can pay off my debt when you can't pay off your debt. But then imagine that both of us see that man's son come. And that man's son owes no debt. And he looks at me and he looks at you and he says, I'm going to pay off your debt. And so he pays that debt. 
Now, my debt has not been expunged. It's been transferred. I now owe nothing to that man. All of my debt I now owe because that, the debt has been paid. I owe that debt to his son. Now that son now owns that debt. That son gets to set the conditions for that debt. And the son says this. I paid off that debt. You owe nothing to my father. You are now reconciled to my father on this condition that you accept this as a gift with no strings attached. Don't try to work for it. Don't try to earn it. Accept it as a gift. If you will do that, then I will expunge the debt between you and my father and there will be reconciliation. If you, have to, if you try to earn it, if you try to work for it, if you try to pay for it, then the debt is still there and there, there will come a day where you will have to account for that debt. It's a gift. It must be accepted as a gift. Now, if I accept that gift, certainly not working for it, I certainly haven't earned it, I'm not going to be able to walk around boasting about the fact that I accepted the gift that was given to me. There is nothing by which I can boast. It was a free gift given to me, but I still had to accept it. Even if the payment was already made, if I do not accept the gift, it is not mine. If I wrote your name in this Bible and I paid for it outright, and it's intended for you, and I always intended it for you, and I hold it out to you, and I say, this is yours, it's got your name in it, it's paid for, no strings attached, it is yours. And you walk away, and you tell everybody, Pastor Wickler got me a Bible, and it's my name on it, and it's so nice, and they say, oh, that's great, can I see it? And you look at them and say, well, I, I didn't take it. Oh, but he, but, 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 but he paid for it for me, and, and, he, and there's no strings attached, okay, but, 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 but if you didn't take it, well, then you don't have it. Then it's not yours. Your name may be written in it. It may be for you. It may have been purchased for you. But if it sits on my shelf for the rest of your life, you don't have that Bible. And so, yes, in Adam, all died. In, in Christ, all can be made alive. The provision was made for all to be saved, but that gift must be received. Adam's disobedience made many sinners. Jesus' obedience made many righteous. Not your obedience, his obedience. Not your righteousness, his righteousness. Christian, your justification is not about you. Your justification is about Christ. Not about what you have done, not about what you will do, but what Jesus has already done for you. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins because we are sinners. And because we are sinners, there is nothing that we can do to earn, work, or otherwise be worthy of heaven. Going to church will not get me to heaven. Having believing parents will not get me to heaven. Getting baptized will not get, get me to heaven. Uh, doing good works will not get me to heaven. Saying some creed will not get me to heaven. Heaven is one thing and one thing alone. Whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. One way and one way only. And that's through the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. So that's salvation. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. When Jesus died, his death paid the price for our sin. And that Jesus rose, it proved that the Father has accepted his sacrifice and that Jesus can do the thing that he promised he could do, which is raise us from the dead. If I have a dead Savior, he certainly can't give me eternal life. But if he's alive, then he can make me alive too. That he can raise me from the dead. And so when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will doubtless come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also there's power in that promise because Jesus rose from the dead. There's power in that promise because there is an empty tomb. And so the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the foundation. If you've never done that, today's a great day to do that. To accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. To come to the place where you acknowledge that you cannot save yourself and you need Him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. But with that foundation in place, let's get to where we're going. Verses 20 and 21 of Romans 5. 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So then Paul brings the idea of the law in. And he's talked about the law a couple of times in the book of Romans. He talked about it in Romans 2. We recognize that he's writing to an audience that is made probably uh, at least uh, considerably, if not primarily, of believing Jews, those who had come out of Judaism. And Paul, talking here, contemplating first Adam's sin and Jesus' sacrifice. But as he contemplates justification and salvation, he's talking about grace. Sin reigned, he says then, through the righteousness that is in the law. Sin reigned, thus offenses reigned through the law. In other words, Paul says that when God imp imposed the law through Moses, that law brought with it a consciousness of sin, that to whatever degree man did not know the extent to which he was an offender against the righteousness of God, when the law entered, it proved beyond a shadow of a doubt just how deeply we all offend God's, God's righteousness. Because no man can keep the law. No man is successful at keeping the law. No man can possibly keep the law. And so the law, Galatians 3 tells us, is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to draw us into the reality of our own condemned state in order that we might see that there is nothing in ourselves that is sufficient. So the law entered, and when the law entered, the offenses abounded. It does not mean that... that, that um, Men were more wicked when they, they were faced with the law. It means that as man learned about the law, he realized how, how wicked he was because he was given the standard. The standard shows us how wicked we are. And thus sin reigned unto death. And then came the day when all of those offenses were nailed to Christ's cross. All of those offenses were imputed to that one who is Jesus of Nazareth. And the only thing left for those who accept this payment then, if all of those offenses were nailed to Christ's cross so that Jesus Christ becomes the one who fulfilled the law, that's what he said. He said, I am not come to abolish the law, I am come to fulfill the law. If it was all fulfilled in him on that day, then the only thing left for me if I accept that payment, is grace. God's forgiveness at Christ's expense. Reconciliation to the Father through the Son. Not through me, not through my church, not through my parents, through the Son, through Jesus Christ. Where sin abounded in my life, where sin abounded in your life, Grace did much more abound. And in any normal spiritual context, this would be terrifying to see sin abounding in my life. It would be damning. It would be eternity ending. But it isn't because where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace is more than equal to my sin. That as sin reigned unto death, even so grace reigns in me unto eternal life through my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been given a new name. My identity is not in myself. My identity is in the one who died for me. I am covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. When God sees me, he does not see the sin of Jamin Wickler. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Clothed in Christ's righteousness, grace reigns supreme. Okay, good, wonderful, powerful. All that is mine. Christ is mine. I am his. Reconciled to the Father. Great. There's my introduction this morning. We're now at the foundation where we can build onto what we're supposed to talk about. Let's get to the point. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Christian, you're under grace. Okay, great, under grace. Nope, no, I'm, I'm, I, I have eternity settled now. I have uh, the home in heaven. Grace abounds in my life. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. To whatever degree I can sin, grace is beyond capable of, 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 of covering that sin. It is, it is beyond capable of, of handling the task of my sin. Great, now I can do what I want then, right? I'm free. I'm free to sin with impunity. If, if grace abounds much more than my sin abounds, then I can sin and grace is there to catch me every time. I am finally free to indulge my flesh without any reservation, without any remorse, without any fear of punishment. Jesus died so that I could be the authentic me, the sinful me without hesitation or regret, right? Wrong. That's not it at all. If you think that, you've missed it but maybe not in the way you think you've missed it. You're right, pastor. You're right. That's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is that because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm condemned to live a boring life where I can't do all the things that I want. I'm condemned to, to, condemned to struggle for the rest of my life against myself, doing that which God wants and not doing what I want, becoming effectively a spiritual slave to a very hard taskmaster for the rest of my life. You're right, pastor, that's the Christian life. I have to give my money and I have to give my time and I have to give my freedom and I have to give my will and I have to give it all to this guy who did this thing for me as some sort of grand manipulative scheme whereby he's blackmailing me into doing what he wants. The great opiate of the masses, right? Religion. Well, if you think that, you've missed it too. Not only are either of those not what Christ died for, not why Christ died for you. That's not why Christ took on your sin. Not only is that, of course, despite to the spirit of grace, but it makes no sense. Jesus did not die in order to give you leave to sin, nor did Jesus die in order to force you against your will to do things. As, see, sin isn't freedom, Christian. There is no freedom in sin. Everybody sins. We're all capable of sinning. You know what's hard? Not sinning. That's the hard thing. Sin is not hard. Sin is natural. But here's the problem. Sin is awful. Bitterness is awful. Anger is awful. Lust is awful. Gossip is awful. Dishonesty is awful. There are things that give me temporary benefit. Stealing is awful. These things give me temporary benefit, but they have long-term damaging effects on relationships, on people, on society, on function. But I can't stop doing it. I say this specifically for our second and third generation Christians whose parents have well protected them from some of the worst effects of sin in the world. There's a temptation in your heart to see the freedom of those who are without doing the things that they want to do. When you know what? So many of those people that are out there doing what they want to do are just aching for some way to stop. To stop doing what they thought they wanted to do, but which is actually destroying their life. That's not freedom, Sin is baked into the very fiber of my being. Sin doesn't bring freedom. Sin brings bondage. True freedom is the ability to deny sin in my heart and life. See, the problem with your sin is not that you're guilty. The problem with your sin is that it is utterly inferior to the life that you've been created by God to live. The reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross to reconcile you to the Father is not simply because you're guilty and God is angry. Jesus is a nice guy who wants to make God not angry at you anymore. It is because your life under sin is inferior to what God intended you to live. God had a way that he created humanity to live. He designed us to live in a certain way and then sin came in and blew it all up. Now it's our fault. I say that in the third person. We brought sin into the world and blew it all up. Can I put it that way? Let's not, let's not in any way, shape, or form make us think that this is not our fault. We blew it all up. 
And now we live in the bondage to this thing and we cannot live well aligned with what God has designed. And the better I can get, the closer I can get to God's design, the better it gets. But the problem that stands in the way of me and God's design is sin. So Christ came into the world to break those chains, to reconcile me to the Father so that I, so that you and I can live in a manner that is consistent with what God designed and therefore be satisfied. We sang at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. We talked about that word happy. We qualified it. We're talking about joy there, not circumstantial happiness. At the cross, the burden of my heart rolled away. What is that burden? That's sin. That's the burden. Sin is not freedom. Sin is not release. Anybody can sin anytime. As a matter of fact, we do it every day. What is hard is getting that burden released. That's something that I was without strength to do. That's something that you were without strength to do. But when you were without strength and when I was without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The objective of grace is not to let you live an inferior, meaningless, and utterly stunted life without fear of consequences. The objective of grace is to free you from the consequence to take that burden off of your back so that then you can come out of that inferior, meaningless, and utterly stunted life of sin and live something different, live in newness of life. But not just new, Christian, better. Better in every conceivable way. The believer does not live dead to sin because God has been so good to him that he simply feels a deep obligation to give up everything that he loves for the sake of, the, uh, of Jesus who loves him. That is not the Christian life. A believer lives dead to sin because the love of Jesus Christ has shown him that there is something so much better, so much higher, so much greater. And once we have experienced that better way, our love changes, our desire changes. Once you have experienced the better way, you don't want the old way anymore. You don't love that thing anymore. You don't love it anymore because you realize how inferior it is, how there's something so much better, how there's something so much greater, and now that is your goal, that is your aspiration, that is your desire. So your love actually shifts. It shifts from the things of this world to the things of the world to come, not because you're under some sort of debt or obligation, but because you see, you see now, you, you, you received your sight and you recognize that the things of the world to come are so much better than the things of the world that are. That I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath come into the heart of man what God hath prepared for them that love him. To that end, we love him all the more. So that to continue to live in the filthy rags of my unrighteousness is utterly senseless. To use grace as the safety net or the backstop for me to live that life of unrighteousness is senseless. To pursue that lust or that pride or that anger, that bitterness or that greed is so far below the life into which you have been redeemed that it is unthinkable, spiritually speaking, that you or I would continue in sin that grace may abound. Not because God is standing up there with a lightning bolt ready to strike us down. Nope, grace abounds well beyond our sin. Not because we are under some sort of obligation or debt uh, that, 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 that God will hold against us, although we will be we, we receive rewards and suffer loss for such things in the life that is to come. But because it is so, that, that life out of which we have come is so inferior. Christ did not die for you to live your own life without consequence, Christian. Christ died to show you how to live a life so much more consequential. He died to reconcile you to God. So that you might go to heaven, of course, but Christ also died so that your life today might not be what it once was, but something new, something different, and something superior in every conceivable way. So Paul continues, verses five through seven. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were placed into Christ, into his death, into his burial, into his resurrection. This is the picture and purpose of water baptism. Water baptism does not have any true spiritual effect. It is a step of obedience and in obedience to the Lord's command that he has given to us. And yet, what is the picture? This is why we baptize by immersion. <laughs> Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. The picture as the person goes underwater is that of him being buried to demonstrate with, to the world your death to the association of the world and your life to the association of Jesus Christ, that you've been given a new name, that you have been born again. And the reason why this is so significant is because one who is dead is freed from sin. If I have died, then sin has no more power over me because I am dead. But you didn't stay dead, did you? Now, if I as a pastor were to baptize someone and I were just to put them in the water and hold them down there, they're dead. I mean, they're, they're, they'll be dead, but, but like, I, I pull you out. If I, I'm a good pastor, I pull you back out of the water, right? I don't just leave you in the water because you don't just stay dead. You raise to walk in newness of life. You come back out of the water. You, you come out of the grave. Let's continue reading, verses six, eight, 8 through 11. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You didn't just die with Christ, Christian. You rose with him too. And just as Christ rose and death hath no more dominion over him, so too you are risen with Christ and death has no more dominion over you. To this end, Paul says, reckon it to be so, account it to be so, believe it to be so. You're dead unto sin and you're alive unto God. This is your identity. This is your name. This is who you are in Christ. So walk in it, Christian. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. If you are in Christ, walk in Christ. And with that, let's follow Paul into some type of conclusion. Verses 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What does it look like to walk in newness of life? It looks like a rejection of the dominion of sin over your life. Not embracing sin because of the prevalence of grace. Why would any man or woman embrace death when they've been ushered into life? What would compel a man to put back, put, put, himself back in chains of darkness when at once those chains of darkness have been broken off of him. Rather, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Why? Because God demands it. Because God is a harsh, unfeeling God who, who, who demands my fealty. No. There's coming a day where every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, where he will demand that. <laughs> But under grace, no. We yield our members as, as instruments of righteousness unto God because we recognize that it is superior in every way to yielding our members to unrighteousness. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the cold condemnation of the law the cold condemnation of God's expectations of holiness, Jesus fulfilled that for you. You are under the release, the freedom of grace. Grace does not free you to sin. Grace frees you to serve with distinction the Lord who loved you. This is why grace exists, not to continue in sin, but to be able to live in the fullness of the release from your sin. This is your birthright in Christ, Christian. Freedom from sin is your birthright in Christ. And being made free from sin then, you are now free to become a servant of righteousness. 
something which you could not do in your sin, something that you cannot do outside of the Spirit of God. You might be able to serve morality, you might be able to serve ritualism, you might be able to serve religion, but you can only serve Christ through His Spirit, the Spirit of grace. Now, tomorrow is New Year's, and there are very few secular holidays which have any real spiritual value. We recognize the three holidays that are rooted in the church, Resurrection, Christmas, and Thanksgiving, Outside of those within our, our, uh, our, our um, secular holidays, yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we can make Fourth of July work because of freedom in Christ, and you can make Memorial Day work because of our forefathers. You can make all of those things work, but there's not a whole lot of value in secular holidays. But interestingly enough, um, New Year's perhaps has more value than any of the other secular ones to the believer because the Christian life is so very much about newness, isn't it? Because we see that idea in Lamentations, thy mercies are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. So newness, the daily renewal of our mind, we, we see a lot of newness in the Christian life. And so New Year's is actually somewhat of, a, of, of an organic holiday as, as, a, as a Christian. We kind of maybe celebrate that every morning in a sense, but, but there's, a, there's an organic nature to, to New Year's. It's a good time of year to be thinking about what was and what is to come, to be, to be, to be thoughtful about such things. And when we think of this great theme of being buried with Christ and risen with Christ, not just to have eternal life, but that we might walk in newness of life. It's a theme that's maybe appropriate for us to think about between today and tomorrow. And maybe as you exit 2023, you become somewhat comfortable in a measure of yourself. You become a, a, a comfortable in sin. You become comfortable in rebellion. You become comfortable in anger or in bitterness and in, in, in some measure of just self. Let's, we'll, just, we'll just stick to that word self. And this carnality wears on you pretty comfortably. It's like an old set of slippers. You just slip right into it and it's, it's comfortable. That pride that's there, it's very comfortable. That anger that's there, it's very comfortable. That resentment that's there, it's very comfortable. And you know what would cost, what would be difficult to do, what would take a lot of emotional uh, energy? It would be to humble yourself. It would be to make things right with those that are around you. It would be to, to cast off the old man with his affections and lusts and put on the new man created in Christ Jesus under righteousness and holiness. And that would take some work. And you know what? Maybe you, you haven't gotten around to that. But maybe as you step into a new year, there's a bit of invigoration, there's a bit of energy. There's a thought toward what could be. And you're not just interested in what's comfortable or what's easy, but you may be interested in a little bit more right now. And if you find that you're in that place of self and it's very comfortable, and you say, well, I'm, I'm quite comfortable here. Well, that is at best a lie. That carnality hangs on you like filthy rags, Christian. Rags which have already been discarded by the King of Kings. Rags intended to be buried with Christ that you've gone and you've put back on for one reason or another, but they don't need to be there. And Christ took those away and they were to be buried with him in order that you might put on the royal gar garments of your sovereign King and that you might walk in that newness of life with that new name with that new identity, with that new association. And maybe you've gotten a little bit comfortable falling back into the old association, falling back to the old name, falling back to the old identity. May I encourage you in this new year. God has withheld nothing good from you in this life. Everything that is good, God has made provision for you to live into in his righteousness and in virtue. The pleasures of sin always come at a cost, and that cost is always far greater than its reward. The crucified life is in no way an inferior life. The crucified life is in no way a, a, an inferior walk. It is superior in every way if only we have the faith to see it and to live into it, to reckon ourselves indeed dead to sin and alive unto Christ. Sin is the dead and rotting vestige of a life lived for that which simply cannot satisfy and it has been overcome by a newness of life against which the pleasures of sin for a season simply cannot compare. Do you believe that this morning, Christian? Or have you been duped? Have you lost focus? Have you become 
complacent? Have you become apathetic? Have you lived into yourself rather than living into the one who died for you? And you've done so because you've been convinced by your heart, by society around you, by, by, by whatever it might be, that that is actually the better way, the superior way, that that is actually the way of contentment, that that is actually the way of happiness. And you, as you sit here this morning, if you can trace contentment and happiness to things in your life, I guarantee you it's not your sin. Temporal happiness, like cotton candy on your tongue, maybe. But may I use the word satisfaction? Not at all. And may this New Year's be such a renewal in our minds that we would bring about a personal and determined release of those areas of our lives where carnality has captured our hearts and our minds. And may we again, in the spirit of Romans chapter 5 into Romans chapter 6, submit our members as instruments unto righteousness, walking instead in newness of life, not because we have to, not because there's an angry God in heaven who's demanding it, but simply because it's a superior way. Determine that sin shall not have dominion over us, for we are not under the law. We're under grace. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.